underneath. So thank you, Langston, again, for the opportunity to be here today. Good evening, everyone, and everyone that's listening. I am Dr. Sharice Janae Nelson. Um, I'm originally from Oakland, California. I'm currently a professor uh, at the Southern University in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, a part of the only HBCU system uh, in the country. Um, I have always been, well, a little about me. I, I, I'm only HBCU educated. Uh, I have all of my uh, degrees from a historically black college or university. Um, and that was mainly because my father, who's only been on a college campus to see my sister or I graduate, said to me that the only people who can teach you who you are are your own. Um, and I felt I felt it very important to make sure I've, I've done that. Uh, I have taught um, all over the country. I've taught at Howard University. Um, I've done uh, summer programs at Yale. I've taught at UC Berkeley, talking, uh, taught in the San Francisco Bay Area, Santa, uh, Santa Clara. Uh, and I found my home in some ways uh, as a junior scholar um, at Southern University. And I'm excited to have the discussion um, because one of the things that I talk about in, in the book is the idea um, that we need Black organizations um, to support uh, our elected officials. And, and without community support, it is difficult um, to keep uh, any legislator uh, holding their feet to the fire if they're holding their feet to the fire while also supporting them without Black civic organizations. So I'm looking forward to the conversation tonight. DeMonte, you still muted, brother. Thank you for that, Dr. Nelson. I think that's a great segue right into this conversation. Uh, if we, if I, we can go ahead and begin. Um, so when you mentioned uh, about that whole thing about um, the community supporting these organizations, obviously in the book you mentioned about the compromise, right? And how, how often we had to compromise and sometimes it wasn't in the benefit of us. Could you elaborate a little bit more on, on that? Yeah, so this is, a, this is a sticking point, I think, often for my students, where we have a conversation fundamentally in American government about the three-fifths compromise, right? And everybody understands, and no one, I think, would suggest the three-fifths compromise uh, was humane. But any historian or any political scientist understands that there is, there is no United States of America without said compromise. And what do I mean by that? The, the problem that the Articles of Confederation presented was more of a Northern problem than a Southern one. Uh, and so the South had direct access to, the, as an agrarian society, had direct access um, to markets across the Atlantic and didn't really need to sell their crops um, up, up North. Uh, and so the, the compromise was necessary to get these, these United States. Why do I bring that up and what does that have anything to do with the book or the Congressional Black Caucus? Because it's the understanding that the, that the body in which they serve in today has been built on a compromise that, ex that says that they are less than human beings. So every time they show up in that, in that body, it is ingrained in the fabric of that body that they do not belong there and that their, and that their being there um, presents them to be less than. Uh, and so this understanding really, really pushes the idea of uh, compromise. And what do I mean by that? Democracy only exists in compromise. And this often requires folks that were racialized from the beginning or embedded as unworthy to begin with to have to further compromise than other folks. Right, and I think throughout that, um, also what I, what I saw that, I, that was uh, consistent throughout that is something called social equity. That it seems like no matter what, it was all, you know, no matter what compromise there were, there still was that conversation about social equity and the lack or the lack thereof. And um, could you like, would you think like even in today's terms based off of, and not to fast forward, we'll go back to this, but when you look at the way the structure is built today and you talk about that social equity, we're still talking about some of those things today. 
right? And, and right. Right. And I, but this is where I think that we have, a, a, I think, a misnomer even about our system. Mm-hmm. Right. And I and I and I talk about this in the conclusion of the book. It is easier to get an Asian hate bill than there is to get civil rights, because giving Asians a, a, a particular set aside or right does not then up in the racial hierarchy in which the country was built on. So so if we mm-hmm. if, and, and so when we when we when we say to our black legislators, you haven't done enough and you do not understand the, the, the built-in restrictions that are in the institution as it is understood, mm-hmm. and then the way that that institution acts itself out, then you are not then giving due credit for the success of Black legislators. Now, I'm not here to say that Black legislators can't be, re- be critiqued. I'm saying that critiquing them without taking into consideration that the structure is built to hamper them, I think is disingenuous. Right, and I think there's something that says we don't fight flesh and blood, but we fight uh, principalities, right? <laughs> and I think that stood out to me. But I, one thing I want to jump to, and, and it just really shook me to the core, is uh, the comments by, uh, I think it's Tammy, Justice Tammy. Tammy. Mm-hmm. Uh, T- Tammy, yeah, could you expand on that a little bit? Because I mean, yes. Uh, I, I mean, I probably can't articulate it the best way you did, but man, when I read that, let me tell you, man, I, it, it, it bothered me to, to the core. And I just, I think, think our viewers would be very, uh, need to hear what you need to say about that. Yeah, so the Dred Scott case, he, uh, uh, um, Mr. Alexander is referring to uh, the Dred Scott case. And the Dred Scott case is included in this book because I argue here in the book that the Congressional Black Caucus is the representation for the for the actual actualization of citizenship. That Black people fully became citizens in these United States once the Congressional Black Caucus founded themselves as a racial caucus set aside then from uh, party politics. Although they of course leaned one way in that poly politics, the fact that they were able to establish themselves uh, as a racial caucus, the very first one of its kind, separates themselves and gives them this full citizenship. This is why the Dred Scott case with Justice Tanny, who is the chief justice, who rules, who gives the chief opinion on the case uh, is important. And the Dred Scott case roughly is the idea that um, Scott was taken out of the out of the slave South. He was taken above the Mason Dixon line in an un um, in an unincorporated or undecided area of the Ohio Territory, and he asked then for his freedom. And then then his freedom was then deliberated at the highest court of the land. His freedom was denied, and it was denied because Justice Tenney said that there is no right. There is no right that a black man has that a white man has to respect. Wow. And that and that the understanding of citizenship was that understanding was codified in the meaning of citizen in our constitution. Wow. And so for you guys who just heard that, I mean, this is law. This this is a chief justice <laughs> of, you know, saying these words about uh, the validity or of, of us as people. And so when I when I say that shook me to the core, that did, and I and I've read a lot of things that have really been, you know, have really bothered me as a black man. Uh, but when I read that, and and just I guess I was just in the right setting of just really being focused on those words and what they really meant at that time, and who was saying them, and how detrimental it was, and and I'm, I can imagine how 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 hurtful our people were at that time. And but that's why I think that's why I think that the fight that that these the social equity, these civil rights that we're talking about, they are generational fights mm-hmm. because the structure as we understand it does not see us as holy members that should participate. And that has become evident, I even think, in we can just use a, a Congressional Black Caucus member in Lucy Bath, right? Mm-hmm. Lucy, Lucy McBath is the is our is our greatest example of this. They redrew districts districts in Georgia just to cut her out of being able to win. She was in a toss-up district that used to belong to New Gingrich, and New Gingrich, as many people know, served as Speaker of the House during the Clinton years, and they cut up the district just to ensure that Lucy Bath, a woman who was currently serving in Georgia, a Congressional Black Caucus member, could not win again. 
And, and we're currently seeing that across the country, especially in Texas where we are. We just had our redistricting where we saw some districts that I worked in for Democrats, uh, 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 a, a Hispanic woman running her in a Republican district. And the, the momentum that we've gained, we gained over those two to three years, you know, it was getting a little too close for them. So what, did they, what happened? They redrew the district, right? So they pushed it further north. So all the gains that we've had for those past three years are now eliminated. And so you have to kind of start over. And now we're seeing that on the municipal level, not as bad, but now, you know, the municipal level has some type of formula to where how they redraw their districts. But uh, re uh, redistricting is a real thing, especially stacked on top of everything that's already against us. So uh, that was, I'm so glad that you had that in there. And something that I, that I wanted to ask, I've been meaning to ask you, because it seems like this is a repetitive theme, is like we take one step forward, but there's always two steps back in repeals and those things like that. Now we're seeing even voting rights with a Democratic president and a Democratic House, it's still like voting rights is still not something that's gonna be pushed through or like even advocated for. So could you talk about, well, I think this is two parts. Could you talk about why do you think that continues to be a struggle? We, I think we kind of know on the surface why that is, but what are some, what are some strategies or uh, ways that we, can continue, uh, that we can possibly get through this? Why can't we just keep having progress year after year after year other than taking those steps back? Well, I, I want to tie it directly into what you said about redistricting. Mm -hmm. And this is what I think people do not understand. The Congressional Black Caucus now is at the point where it's at its most salient point. It represents 25 percent of the Democratic Caucus, which means that it can corner the Democratic Party. We saw this with the ability to get build back better over the finish line. Democrats in their own caucus were struggling, but because the Congressional Black Caucus is not monolithic, just like black people, they were able to go to all uh, at the federal level, go to all areas of the Democratic Party and then be able to bargain with these members that are often white, um, that then allow then for the Build Back Better plan, this economic plan, um, to get over the finish line uh, in the House and get through the Senate. And this, I think, directly speaks to the strategy or, or, or the idea as to why we are seeing what we're seeing. If, if we start to then concentrate power, then there has to be a reshuffling of the deck. And that is that is the consistent fervor and theme throughout American history. That is why um, in this book, I really try to start um, really from the 13th, 14th and 15th Amendment. I really try to start from the amendments to the Constitution, what we call the Reconstruction Amendments, to get people to see the cyclical nature of the more power that Black folks gain than the, than the faster, the snatchback, if that makes sense. Uh, and so we're seeing this redistricting to then, in many ways, limit these Congressional Black Caucus members, because we have to remember that many of them have uh, gained a level of seniority that allows them to be chairmen and chairwomen in, um, on, on, inside of the, uh, inside of the, the Congress. On, on powerful and, committees, yeah. Correct, and, okay. and we have to understand that that is often where legislation is dictated and snatched back. So, the, so if we get to strategy, we have to understand or even look inside the book where, where the Congressional Black Caucus was very keen and learned very early on to tie what they wanted to get accomplished then to the president's agenda. So what we I, what I believe to be still a, a strategy for blacks is to push the president of the United States to use his bully pulpit then to then advance said ends. And this is where we see some conflict, I think, with the Congressional Black Caucus when it comes to Obama. Right. Because throughout their history of being a caucus, they had attached or put a lot of pressure on the president inside of his bully pulpit to get legislation passed. 
right? Uh, but then trying to push a black man on black interests then became problematic. So I think one of the biggest strategies we have, we have to first recognize that the, the reason we're seeing a snatchback is because of the saliency of power, the amount of power black people are amassing at the federal level and then hints at the, at, at the state level and the municipal level. And we have to understand that at the power at mass at the federal level trickles down to the state and then to the municipal. So that's right. the I think thing. that's, do you think we, that's something how we saw with Rep Clyburn using his influence and the caucus to get, you know, certain pe folks elected, Supreme Court justices and those types. I know we, he, his pick wasn't in there, but in terms of what Rep Clyburn did for Biden, because uh, he had a failing presidency. I mean, at, at, at one point, he was not. I, I had that. a failed bid, right? We call, right. we call, we call Clyburn the kingmaker. <laughs> right. Uh, and, and we and we've always called Clyburn the keen maker. And if you look inside my book, you'll see why. Because statistically, if you look at him inside of the Congressional Black Caucus, he is seen to be a moderate or even a conservative. But if you see him inside of the larger Congress at, at, at a whole, he's actually seen to be on a radical twinge. So he is probably one of the uh, as one of the current members, one of the most conservative, quote unquote, black congressional black caucus members who has the ability to then reach across the aisle or then to then bring the Democratic Party together to say, look, I have some black members that are far more radical than me. Do you want are you or do you want to deal with them? Or do you want to deal with me? Now, that's something uh, I want to touch on. Go, go ahead. I'll let you go finish. Ahead, go ahead. A ask yeah. away. So, okay. So now, now we may be touching some nerves here, right? Because some of the work that we've even done here locally, you know, they say oh, all, all skin folk ain't kin folk, right? And so sometimes, the, sometimes when we're trying to help even our own people, there's differences in that. And I, and I think we saw that with Rep Clyburn because some of the more radical or say more liberal sides of even the Democratic Party was at odds with him in terms of some of the things he wanted to do versus them, right? And so I, I think that's where I could, I'm, I'm excited, I'm, I'm interested in hearing your thoughts, but also I think a big part of our community, uh, the 10% of black folks that are in this community or whoever's listening around the country, how, how do we navigate that even within our own communities? Are we saying, hey, you either you with us or you're not, or do we find ways to compromise to, so we can collectively stay together? It's easy. We have to stop relitigating um, uh, in integration versus separation. Mm -hmm. Every generation keeps relitigating that, and we have done that since Marcus Garvey. We have, we have, we we even established our own country in Africa called Liberia, who's celebrating their bicentennial. So the yeah. idea of integration versus separation versus immigration going back to Africa, we've already um, litigated that. And so one of the first things we have to do is stop in every generation litigating that. We have to stop litigating that. And we have to accept everybody where they are in that, whether they see themselves as a part of the structure that as citizens that, that want to vote, us convincing as many people as possible to vote, but those that don't be okay with that. We have to be in a place that we're okay with the more conservative members of our, our ethnicity because they serve a purpose as far as being able to translate our actual desires and needs. Because I think what, it, what truly it is, if we even think about Jim Clyburn, Jim Clyburn may take a different approach to what the reality is, but he believes for the freedom and liberty of black folks the same way a Barbara Lee does, right. the same way a Cori Bush does. But we have gotten into this, and, and this may step on some toes, we have in many ways internalized this idea of the zero sum game, which is really white folks game. That's never been our game. Mm -hmm. And we have internalized that and we play the zero sum game with one another. And by playing the zero game with one another, we, we assist ourselves in all of the false starts and then all of then um, the pushback. Um, that that really makes in many ways us a disjointed people moving forward. Man, and uh, man, whew, and I mean that that that's that's a that's a message there because not only with the pack, I mean we we can see that with a lot of our black institutions here locally, 
not saying that there's not great people, you know, trying to reestablish them and keep them alive, but it it seems like when you point to our local black institutions, it there it always seems like there's a struggle with them, you know, maintaining and sustaining themselves or having having uh, longevity in terms of the mission and what they're trying to accomplish from the black chambers of commerce to the black um, economic development organizations. And I think it's because of that, that point you just made is we're trying to play the zero sum game with each other when in actuality, we're not Atlanta. We're not, we don't have a community of 90% or 80% African-American population. And so I think, you know, for me, I've always been like, hey man, there's not enough of us. So we have to stick together, whatever that is or whatever those ideals are, if we all agree on a common a common interest that a common interest of black people as a whole, then we need to find ways to stick together and work together. Um, similar to, for example, you know our current city council, uh, we have one black representative on our, on council, um, and we have one Republican. And so a lot of times that Republican gets boxed out. But to your point is, like, but we're in a we're in a conservative state. So sometimes how are we gonna get that message across unless we're leveraging that resource that we have there? And so um, what I wanna- So on that point, if you yeah. really quickly, on that point, inside the book, I talk about this with the Congressional Black Caucus members. Before they become the Congressional Black Caucus, they were actually the Democratic Select Commi uh, Committee. And this is, this is after King has died and they have a, uh, they have a, a, a meeting of the minds of black folks in Gary, Indiana. Um, after a black mayor for the first time becomes a mayor of that city. And congressional black, uh, the mighty 13 go to visit before they can be, before, before they become the congressional black caucus. And there is all of this debate that happens, right? They come out with the black declaration of independence and congressional black caucus members help, help form it, help, help to write it, uh, play the role in it, but, but purposefully kept their names off of it. Um, so, and left the meeting saying to themselves, our job is to be the best black legislators. We need to then make sure that we have good black activists that push we need to make sure that we have black uh, religious organizations that push, but our job is to be black legislators thinking about black interests. Charles Diggs, the, the, the first chairman of the Congressional Black Caucus said, black folks do not have a party. Black folks have permanent interest and will use party politics to achieve our permanent interest. Mm -mm. So that, that's a great point there. And also uh, something that I also read in the book, it said it wasn't until Blacks had the numbers um, that did the Black Caucus was established and, and the Black Caucus was established and the political, that the political interest of Blacks became a permanent uh, political interest, right? Could you expand more? Because I, I wrote an article about this in terms of if we don't vote, you know, that our vote, our power is in our vote. And I think this really spoke to me on that. Could you elaborate on that section? So this is something else I tell my students, right? That in when we think about government types, when you think about a monarchy, right? The sovereign power is in the monarchy. You think about an oligarchy, the sovereign power is in the businessmen that run the country. When you're in a democracy, the sovereign power is in the people. And when you decide that you're not going to vote, which is your choice, you have ceded your power. You have said that my power as a member of this democracy that makes up the sovereign will of this nation, I'll throw that away. And what does that mean? Then that means your interests are never to be addressed. The, and I'm not saying that you're going to get everything that you want out of those interests, Come but up. there is no vehicle in which your interests can even be addressed or spoken to if you are not participating in voting. And here is why. Each congressional member uh, roughly uh, represents 700,000 people, right? Of that 700,000 people that they're representing, 30,000 people are normally the max amount of people that then engage with that congressional uh, with that congressional member. So think about that for a second. Yep. If someone's rep representing seven hundred thousand people, but only thirty thousand roughly are, are interacting with them, they are the ones that are dictating then and overusing their power. So this is why that to me it resonates. 
we as black folks are consistently arguing about, well, what has the Congressional Black Caucus done or what has black legislators done? What have you done as far as using your power to number one, elect people and then hold those people accountable by then interacting with your system? Until I can get answers for that amongst people, I, I often then, uh, I don't wanna say I, I, I push away their opinion, but I try to get them to understand that your opinion becomes less and less valuable unless you understand that you have ceded your power. And, and very last to that point on the local level. I've worked on several campaigns as probably you have. Mm -hmm. You and I understand what a propensity score is. Oh yeah. A propensity score is the score that is used to, de to decide how money is spent. A propensity score says out of X number of elections, how many of you voted it? And, and if you don't you have a propensity yeah. score, yeah. Right. Yeah. and if you don't have a propensity score or three or better, then the likelihood of then that whoever's running in whatever office to spend money to reach out to you becomes slim to none. So if you're, if you're wondering why you're invisible to your system, it's because you're sending the signal to your system that you want to be invisible. Ooh, man, that's a word right there. Langston, if that's not cut up into a clip and shared on social, man, th that that piece right there, it, and she's exactly right. When we, when we look at those demographics, when we look at those demographics, we open up that field plan. That's the first thing we're looking at. And that's how we get our first volunteers, right? Is we look at the at the four fours, out of the last four elections, who's voted Democrat or whatever, if you're on the other side, but we, we go out and grab those people and then we go out and grab the threes. And then if we got money, we may go out to twos, but that's very rare. Do you have enough money or resources to go reach somebody who may, who, who more than likely will not go vote, right? And so, I mean, I, I've never heard anybody explain it that way, but I mean, that's the best way that I've heard it in clarity in terms of what it means when you don't do that, <laughs> you don't vote. Because people always say, well, my vote doesn't count and all that, but I think you kind of laid that out, what happens when you don't. And I think that was just amazing how you, how you laid that out. Uh, one thing you did mention, is about churches and we and, and some of us know uh and maybe most people know maybe they don't that a lot of the work that was done back in those days was through those churches right those are those are places where black people congregated and information was passed and you know all the influ influence was there um san antonio is i'm not sure where you're at but uh, san antonio was uh is is a, a community with tons of churches and um, we, we're not seeing that as influence as much as it was before, right? It's, it's that, that message is not moving through our churches like it used to be. Can you speak to that? Oh, you, you have gotten me riled up. My husband <laughs> is, my husband is a, a minute as, as, as the minister of Christian education at the Good Shepherd Baptist Church in Augusta, Georgia. Okay. okay. Um, and so when we talk about church, if we, if you, if, if your listeners go and get, grab the book, I explain how black, how the black church in many ways undergirds black citizenship, because it's the first place where blacks get to uh, vote and work autonomously the same way they would in a democracy. Mm -hmm. um, and so when we think about black church today, one of the biggest reasons that we don't see that message being carried is because there's been a mass exodus from black church when it comes to millennials and newer and, and younger generations. Uh, and my husband is working on a book called um, Why Waiting Your Turn is No Turn at All, a millennial perspective on the black church, the black college, the black family and, the, and black citizenship. And the crux of it and the crux of it is the understanding that the black church is a leg of a stool that black life sits on. And what we have seen is that there's been an erosion to black church, just like a host of other black institutions, black civic organizations, mm -hmm. uh, any religious, not just the black church, but even I would argue um, in, in the um, in, when it comes to uh, Muslims and in the, in the nation of Islam, we've seen a eroding right of black institution. And why is that the case? 
because there has been a level of affirmation outside of black spaces. And I'm not in any way uh, saying that we should not look for affirmation in other spaces. What I am saying is there's no space that can love you like your own space. And for those of the listeners that are on, they remember, if you remember watching, um, a different world and yeah. and Whitley goes into why she's attending human and HBCU right or why she's there we have to remember that if we abandon our own institutions in trade of other folks institutions who is going to be left to build our own right and so I, I I think the biggest reason that we are seeing the church in many ways separate is because there's been this tension there's been this tension with from one generation to the next generation. There's been tension about waiting your turn versus uh, versus busting down the line or busting down the hierarchy. There's been tension about integration versus um, a, a versus integration versus being separate. There's been tension about um, about the centering of whiteness of Jesus in black church, right? There has been so much tension that we have not we have not learned how to deal with internally, insularly, right? And that's one thing I, I will say about the Congressional Black Caucus. They try to keep all of their fighting on the inside, right? And right. that's something that we haven't done well. And so it has now had a ripple effect um, in our other Black institutions. And, 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 to, and to close very quickly, not to belabor the point, I think that we have to, and this is a clarion call to anybody that's listening, younger people, millennials, if you are upset about a black institution, I challenge you to join it and change it. Mm. Instead of and instead of going to separate yourself and try to reinvent the wheel, I I challenge you to join them and change them because our, because there are generations that are dying looking for us. Now, I'm not saying it's going to be easy. <laughs> and I'm not saying that you're always going to be um be welcomed when you come. But what I am saying to you is that if you do not invest in them, they will disappear and there'll be nowhere to go. And that, that's a point there. And that's, I mean, it's, I feel like, man, where have you been all my life? Because a lot of these things that you're talking about, you know, we've been dealing here. I'm, I'm sure a lot of communities deal with it, but more specifically, we've dealt with those, right? We have, you know, split organizations that have similar interests for black people. And, you know, one thinking that the other one's dysfunctional, so there's another one created. And so that point is, you know, hey, become a member, change, change it from within. But also, I think a member told me, you know, look, it's OK to uh, to have a difference in opinion, but have a difference in opinion in our tent. Be in our tent and have that not outside of the tent. And that's what I, I'm so happy that you, you brought up that about the Black Caucus. It's like, yeah, we're going to have our fights, but we're going to fight as a family. And we're going to keep this internal. We're going to work it out internally. But to the external, we're going to move as a unit. And I think that's a great message um, uh, to have in terms of the work that, that we're doing. A couple of things came up to me uh, when you were talking on your last one. One was bounce rate, which is probably really off topic uh, when it comes to, you know, um, going outside of our communities for, for you know, affirmations, those other things. But even spending in our own communities, um, you know, supporting our own community churches, those types of things. But one thing up before that is succession planning. When we talk about, uh, for example, you know, we see uh, disparities across our communities in a lot of different reasons. You know, racism is definitely one of those uh, issues. You know, San Antonio has, is, is, uh, is segregated by highway, by education, I mean, by the roads, by the education, uh, school districts, we have way too many school districts uh, and also uh, by housing. Um, but we also see that some of the districts that are more successful and have better things and have more economic stability have a succession plan. The person who's in the seat was vetted by the person before them and, and it keeps going. But we see in, in the black communities or the communities represented by um, uh, black representatives, you know, good luck staying in office two years if you're a local elected official. And so it keeps, it's a repetitive cycle where we, in the last six years, we've had four or five different council members. And so could you, could you um, shine some light on, or maybe some insight on, on uh, or even guidance on how we, how you, how you kind of stabilize that and start to planning, uh, strategically planning how to uh, consistently uh, represent a district. 
Well, you just you you've just hit the nail on the head. We can't keep our dollar in our community, which makes it very difficult to succession plan with anything because with money, are you going to plan? Uh, and, and, and what do I mean by that? We know that the Asian dollar stays in its community for two weeks. We know that the black dollar leaves its community in six minutes, right? So, so the, the, the foundational piece of it is that fact that we do not have the financial resource Right. And right. the and the places and I don't want to belabor the point about churches, but the place that we used to have that could then leverage said financial resource was the church. Um, and so what we have to think about when we're talking about secession is we have to get serious about then taking uh, taking all black civic organizations all black religious organizations and putting them in one room and and getting their non-negotiables and then allowing then those non-negotiables then to then create a formula and a plan for how we move forward. It's bigger than just one elected official. It's bigger than just the the the, the mayor or the council person. It is a it's a local strategy about how do we keep our money in the community? Or if we can't keep it directly in our own businesses, how do we then make alliances with business that are going to respect us that then allow us, allow our money to have power or, or that dollar to have power? That's number one. Number two, how do we then in that, in that creation, how do we then identify then uh, allies that are not going to forsake us as soon as more money comes to them? Right. That's the second piece. And then the third piece is how do we then establish generations to then continuously push the needle forward or push the rock up the hill? And what do I mean by that? Who is in their 40s? Who is it? Because a generation is every 20 years. Who's in their 20s? Who's in their 40s? Who's in their 60s? Are the folks in the 60s talking to folks in the 40s and the people in the 40s? talking to people in the in, in the 20. And once we start doing that, we will start to see more consistent growth. I'm not saying we're not going to see some drawbacks and step backs, but we're going to see far more consistent growth. And if we you if we go back to the Congressional Black Caucus and we even look at these members, a lot of these older members, although there may have been squabbles and fights, what you will notice is for the most part they're embracing these newer members. You mm -hmm. do not see this 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 stiff arm to younger members. There is, I don't agree with you on this, but here's a strategy on how to use this. I may not agree with you here, but here's a strategy that you use here. So what? One, another thing that I think that the Congressional Black Caucus has done well is embracing right, the next generation, something that we have to do. So to me, that's the strategy. That was one of the biggest reasons that I started um, uh, the Black Leadership Roundtable an uh, 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 as a nonprofit just to be a platform where Black civic leaders can get together and have conversations unrecorded with everyone in the room to get the raw, dirty, and ugly out so that then a secession plan can then be provided per your um, per your neighborhood, per your municipality, per your state. That's awesome. So try pivoting back to, and I, I, I kind of wanted to ask this in the beginning, but we just jumped off to us. So we just, we just took off. So could you, could you talk to us or the audience about uh, even when, before, before the book, what, what was inspired you to write this book? What was going on? What challenges were you dealing with? What were you seeing that, I mean, uh, when I, I'm, a, I'm a novice columnist, but well, what I didn't realize is how much research goes into writing. And, and for someone to, to write, to, to, to take the time and, <laughs> and the commitment, and it's part of your life and writing a book. What was it that, that lit a fire into you to, that felt like this book needed to be written? Yeah, I told someone, I said, um, this, this, this book right here is two years of my life that'll take you a maximum of two weeks to read. Um, and what what really happened, Mr. Alexander, is I got into a heated argument with some Black folks about what the Congressional Black Caucus is not doing. Mm. Um, and we got, I, and it was, it was, I, it was in a quasi educational space, and I mean, it got loud. I mean, we got loud, and I said, and I, and the, and the, and the, the gist of it was, you're so ignorant, you have no clue of what they're blocking. 
You're so worried about what they're passing as legislation that you have no conceptual framework for hmm. all the legislation that they're blocking. I uh, and, 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 and that's when I said, you know what? Of course, no one knows. There is no book written about them. The last book written about the uh, the last book that was written about the Congressional Black Caucus holistically was in 1998 um, by a scholar out of England. Uh, this is one of there's been another book that's been written uh, written about them, but it was about judicial nominations. It was a very specialized book. So there was nothing that that told our stories uh, that told the story of this caucus. Um, and then, to be honest with you, it was difficult because a lot of the Congressional Black Caucus members of the Mighty 13, many of them have passed away. Others are, are fearful for, the, for, uh, for, uh, for exposure, right? Many people are, are scared about what was exposed in this book, what was said, right? Uh -huh. um, have, you, have you disparaged one, you know, because oftentimes members have inside knowledge that the public doesn't, right? right. And when you get to digging through papers, um, then you may, you may be the, the researcher that exposes us, right? So for me, it was the idea that number one, the story wasn't being number wasn't being told. Number two, the story wasn't understood, which was why I did such a, uh, I tried to do a, in the first two chapters of the book, lay the historical uh, framework or groundwork for why such a caucus was necessary to begin with and why one is still needed today. Uh, and then the third thing was I wanted my first piece of scholarship when it came to a book to be about me, um, to be about my life. And um, I dedicated the book to Ron Dullums and, uh, and Elijah Cummings. Um, I, uh, I met, well, not met, but I, I, I knew of Ron Dullums and saw him for the very first time on uh, Halloween night uh, in Jack London Square in Oakland. And I was like, whoever the black man is who's introducing this president, I want to be him, right? And at the time, I was nine years old. Um, and so this, this book, in many ways, was almost like coming back full circle for me, seeing, seeing, seeing Ron Dullums on the, on the campus of Howard University as the first fellow of the Ron Walters Center. Ron Walters was the academic brainchild for the Congressional Black Caucus. And then seeing him on the campus um, and, all of, and all of it wrapped together, I said to myself, who better but me? Um, right. And I spent a lot of time at the, at the library in, in, at Howard in the Moreland Spring Yard, uh, researching um, the preliminary papers of the Congressional Black Caucus and then the papers of uh, Ronald Douglas. Well, what I can say is that I was pleasantly surprised at how well it was written and how clear the story was. Uh, it helped me really understand in bite-sized pieces, the story in chrono chronological order in terms of when, what, how our rights were. <laughs> we had rights, we didn't have rights, we have these rights, we didn't have these rights. And it really helped understand um, why, those why they were at that time. We talked about that word compromise and when the times we did have to compromise. And, and also the players like the, the individuals who were the causes of those things. I was really, um, I was actually, you know, a lot of times we think we're so far into history. It's, you know, when I looked, I, said, I did the math, it's only 65 years ago that it was solidified, right? To where the federal and the state were actually on the same page in terms of considering us as, this, uh, as equal people, right? And obviously we're still fighting that today, but I looked at myself, I was like, man, that's three generations ago. That's my grandmother, right? And I and I'm like I'm like guys like when people say we've come far, like we haven't. We're still living in this, in, in my opinion. Like when I'm saying 65, this is not a thousand years ago. We're talking about 65 years ago. Like this, we were not even considered as as people that could be participants in this democracy. And, so, and that's why I think that's why I think the book was so important, right? Yeah, it's it, yeah, it's the yeah. idea that. Look what the Congressional Black Caucus has done. It has made you think that these realities are so far ago. Yeah. They have th their ability to be able to actualize legislation has pushed us so far that we have realized we haven't even realized that it hasn't been that long ago. No. And then don't even get us started on women, 
right? <laughs> because now right. we're talking about the 70s, <laughs> right? I think we're talking about and, the, and, the and 70s. And that's my next days. book. That's my next book. My next book is on the uh, is on the women of the Congressional Black Caucus. That's the next work that I am working on as a specialized book. Um, and this book will show you that the Congressional Black Caucus was not uh, necessarily discriminatory against women as far as being in leadership. Uh, there have been several uh, Congressional Black Caucus uh, mem members that are women who have been the chairwomen of the caucus for the legislative session and that they have to be voted in. So that, that speaks that they're not appointed, they're voted in by their colleagues, so that speaks wildly. But when it comes to their success uh, mathematically inside of the Congress, um, neither, neither one of the chairwomen that I looked at in the book were uh, statistically um, effective. So that speaks greatly, right? Not just to the caucus, but then to our overall society at large as how black women in particular hold this double minority that plays roles in even them being elected. And I know that you know that um, right. by leading up this path. Right. And I did see that you have, you listed statistics in the book too, in terms of you listed the members and their statistics. So I thought that was very, very clever. Uh, and I said, man, she thought this whole thing through, like she thought this through in terms of you looked at it like, OK, what what do people need to to understand and what do people need to to what do I need to give them so they'll understand what I'm trying to say here. And so if 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 there was a takeaway and, and I hate to limit it to a takeaway because there's so many things that I took away from what I read, I'll, I'll give you two. <laughs> what what are two takeaways that you want people, when people read this book, what do you want them to take away or what do you want them to understand fundamentally? This quote right here. The ability to be an American citizen and Black's full national citizenship is the constant fight for the members of the Congressional Black Caucus. Their existence, strength, and effectiveness rebukes the claims of Black savagery, annihilates the claims of Black unworthiness, and forces the United States of America to live up to her creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This is what I want folks to ultimately take from the book. That the Congressional Black Caucus's job is to chiefly protect your citizenship protect the right for you to even bring claims to your government. Right. That is their chief responsibility. And because that's their chief responsibility, it is up to us as Black people inside of civic organizations, inside of Black church, inside of Black schools, to then push those legislators to actualize our real interests at the federal level as much as possible. That's awesome. I know Langston has to get to some questions. And what one thing before he jumps to that, I want to read the last paragraph of a column I wrote. Uh, it was about uh, fight voter suppression and make good on the 15th Amendment's promise. And it kind of leads, it's kind of a good summary to uh, what she just led into is, and it starts, I'm going to paraphrase to the end. It says, we should not only be encouraged to vote because it's our civic duty or because our vote builds a greater democracy, democracy, even though both are true. What we need to understand is that voting is about power. The power, uh, this power affects real change with the issues we care about and is our only mechanism to upend structural racism. When we as black and Latinx people exercise our right to vote, everyone wins. Langston, you got questions? questions. I, I do. I want to um, first uh, just lay out, thank both of you for the conversation. I want to take credit for pairing y'all together because I think y'all y'all on the same wavelength. And, and Sharice, I had no idea about um, the work that you were doing with your nonprofit. Can you say the name of your organization again? Yes. Yes. It's called um, the um, um, Black, Black Leadership, Leadership Roundtable. Round round Okay, and so um, I didn't know, Sharice, that you were also I, you were also an entrepreneur in that way. But I also want to make the audience aware that uh, Sharice did a process of publishing this book. I believe you self-published the book. Was the conversation we were having earlier, and it takes it takes courage to be able to do that as a scholar, um, and to have the, um, the the integrity and confidence in yourself to be able to do that. And so 
one of the things that I, I appreciate about the work is that you did it yourself, not only doing the research, but the whole process of like getting this book out there. And so before we go to the audience's questions and the audience, you can type your questions in the chat or you can raise your hand. I want to ask this. Can you talk about what that process was like? Like, what did it mean for you to be an entrepreneur, an author and a scholar in terms of you getting this book produced? I think it's an excellent question. So really what it came down to for me was this. I said to myself, now, wait a minute. This is like the rap game. Like you're taking all of my intellectual property, copywriting it, and then reselling it at, at the price that you dictate. And I get the profit that you decide. Uh, mm. So what, so I, I, although I did, I, I did, uh, I did publish it on a press. It's on what's called a vanity press, meaning that it's still self-published. I did it through Archway Press and I used Archway Press because I am a, they, I am a scholar and I needed to make sure I had a press on the book for it to be recognized. Um, and this particular vanity press is through Simon and Schuster, um, which does, uh, normally does, uh, the presidential memoirs. So it had, there was some level of legitimacy i was trying to attach some level of legitimacy to it the second piece is that one thing about if anyone picks up the book you will see that all the materials copyrighted to me so that was the biggest piece for me was the the idea that the, the material was copyrighted to me so that you know in perpetuity my estate will get um all of the proceeds from this book now that took a lot of courage langston honestly um i had many people discourage you know uh speaking to me against doing that um i had a lot of uh, a lot of folks and, and, and let me say to you one of the biggest reasons i went this route is because i tried to go the more traditional route and i won't name the publishers but the idea that I was centering racism or calling the Congress in its foundation racist was a bridge too far for some publishers. Uh, and so it really left me with a decision. Do I sensitize what I want to say in this work or do I do I step out on faith and essentially finance um, me publishing this own book? Um, and then publish and then marketing it, right? I am currently vacillating um, about the money that I am going to spend to market it. And so what I will say to that point is, is that although you can self-publish, um, they still own the distribution arm. And so you can own it and you can have it and it can be yours, but it's just like the music industry that allowed folks to then start their own record labels. If I still own distribution, I still have some level of control. So I, 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 I am happy that I have I was able to keep the content the way that I wanted to. That I was I did not have to sanitize it, but I have in many ways uh, sacrificed uh, the larger machine marketing and pushing the book. That's what we're here for. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So y'all got to make sure y'all go buy this book to support Dr. Nelson and the work that she's doing. Uh, I see that we don't have any questions in the chat or in the q and I did want to ask um, one question based upon what you said that that really, man, it, it nudged me in a way because I'm really upset with older black people. Um, and I, I carry a lot of judgment, especially in the city that I live, because I feel like they ain't really built nothing of black excellence here. Um, but your your commentary about seniority and the value of seniority, especially as it exists um, in politics, is not something I think that younger folks who haven't been as involved really understand. And so I appreciate sure, you sure. mentioning that. And I'm just wondering, can you talk about how how that the the black um, the black congressional caucus, like how can that be a model for the way that we do business with our elders moving forward? One of the things I thought about, I'm about to answer the question. Look, I'm rambling, but listen, I was just wondering, look, I think every black organization should have somebody from every decade of being an adult on their board, leadership board, right? So some real position where they have voting power. So if you're in divine nine, a 20 year old should have power. A 30 year old should have power. 40, 50, 60, 70, however old you can be. That way it makes all of those generations. I'm thinking like affirmative action based upon age within 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 black organizations 
So here's our here's where our biggest problem lies. Our biggest problem lies again from and Franz Fanon calls it, you know, um, uh, understanding of the, the white gaze, if that makes sense. So one of our biggest problems, I think, Langston, is is that we have self-imposed the white gaze on ourselves in in each of these generations and the and the upsetness or the or the or the tension that you feel is because of that white gaze and here's what i mean by that older black people have and me and my husband talk about this when it comes to the baby boomers baby boomers were are, are loyal right they were loyal to institutions and we as their millennial children have watched their loyalty not then be celebrated so we have now become loyal to ourselves right and loyal to ourselves chief chief than anything else so when we come to the table to have conversations regardless of, uh, of the hierarchy of an institution we have to think about the fact that one group of people is one group of one generation is, is worried about being loyal to themselves, while the other generation is worried about being loyal to the institution. And that, by definition, is a clash. So what we have to understand is we have to then remove this white gaze of needing it to be one or the other. This is where we get into, I, I think, the struggle. We get into the struggle if we think about it from a, from a glass perspective. Younger folks want to argue is half empty. Older folks want to argue it's half full instead of just dealing with the empirical measurement of where the water actually is, right? It's, it, it, it's in the middle, right? And that to me is why we are consistently seeing this tension. And I, I, I am seeing, I know at least here in Baton Rouge, in the Divine Nine, I, I'm a member of the 100, um, the 100 Black Women. Um, and I am one of the younger members, but I am the chair of the public policy um, committee for the 100 Black women. So I'm seeing it happen. I'm seeing older people make space for younger people, but younger people have to understand that if you're asking them to come with the same loyalty to themselves, they are always going to choose loyalty of the institution over loyalty to self. And that is what to me consistently causes the friction amongst us is that each of us have to understand that loyalty is what we're after. So if loyalty is what we're after, and we on one side are loyal to ourselves and they're loyal to the institution, where do we find a middle ground so that loyalty is the way that we operate moving forward? I have mm -hmm. never had a broken down like that before. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't realize that, you know, and, and, and I, and, and if you come from someplace else, cause I'm not, I'm not from, from San Antonio, I have an expectation of what I think an institution should be. But my expectations aren't localized expectations that have been here historically. It's 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 very different, and so I appreciate you breaking that down. Go ahead, Demonte. Yeah, so here, so here, it's 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 too much about about how we got we got to have have echo. But she was speaking about before the the black institutions here from my time trying to participate with the local NAACP they're loyal to the institution, right? And so you see that rift in a lot of our black institutions. When I said the dysfunction that we have uh, with our black institutions here, that's exactly what it is. It's those, those generational uh, forces fighting against one another in terms of what, what they value or what, they're, what they wanna be loyal to. You have the older generation who's, who you see them collaborating with the city and the SAPD and the police departments and those other things, and you see the young folks looking at them like in disgust, like how could you do that, right? And so it creates this rift. And, uh, and to your point, Langston, I haven't heard anybody break it down that way, but we gotta find, again, back to this word compromise. We gotta find a compromise for the better good of black people, not for our own individual interests. But I think that's because we have a hard time articulating the goal. If you have a hard time, and this is one of the critiques I have of the Congressional Black Caucus, one of the biggest reasons people feel, one of the biggest reasons younger people have a disgust for the, the collaborations that older generations are willing to make is because there's no understanding of the sacrifice made to get to that point.
There's no, there is no conceptualization for what that even means. And if you, and if older folks are not telling the story or if we're not telling our own story, then how are then younger people going to understand? I had to break it down to a class of mine that my grandmother who's 88 years old does not have a birth certificate from the state of Louisiana where she was born because she was born in Bastrop, Louisiana where they did not recognize her birth. She has a birth certificate from the state from uh, from California by the way of Louisiana where they where my great grandmother told the state of California when she was born the date everywhere and then California had to issue her a birth certificate my grandmother did not have a bank account that was in her own name until she was 32 years old 33 years old because when she was coming up born in 1932 she was not allowed to have a bank account as a woman there, we are not telling the stories enough. So we have to understand that that generations are just assuming, assuming the privilege that they already have. And we, me and my husband talk about this at great length when it comes to Christianity and God. The older songs talk about he's a way maker. He'll make a way out of no way. Our kids don't know anything about that. They don't need a God that's going to provide the, the basic of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. They don't need a God that's going to provide food and water. Mom and daddy did that. They are looking higher up the Maslow archy of needs chain to say, I need help with self-actualization. How does God and Christianity help me with self-actualization? It doesn't mean God has changed. And it doesn't mean that the relevance of God has changed. It means that I need God to speak to me in a different way. And if you and a generation that's older than me can't understand that, you can't point the finger at me to tell me that I don't really understand who God is. So it is this, it is this struggle that I think that the older is not really doing a great job of educating where they used to, where we've come from. We have been so prideful about the places that we've gotten to that we've neglected telling the stories that get us to get to, to get that level of understanding. So that then this younger generation has this level of disgust for an older generation who thought that they, they, they were doing the right thing by hiding that history. And I'll give you this example and I, and I'll and I'll and I promise I'll be quiet. In my family, they left Louisiana because my great great my great great grandfather and his brother got into a tiff with a white man and killed him and they fled to California that story wasn't told until almost all of my grandfather's brothers and sisters were dead and I went back once I got back here to Louisiana as a resident I went digging through the history it was right there in the history but if but if and my mother knew knew her so that what I'm saying to you is there is a current person living on this earth who has a memory of the man who killed a white man because there was an altercation where my where my great 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 grandmother was with life was at at stake and her sons protected her and then she cleared out of her bank she cleared out her mattress and sent them to California and then told them to split up one go to Northern California one go to the South Southern California to for their survival they went out they had wanted signs there was a bounty on their head for twenty thousand dollars story was never told so if we're not telling these stories then how do younger generations even understand how far they really come Langston, Langston, I don't think an hour, hour is enough time, time for this, for this much, much uh, uh, so we're gonna have dr nelson back when she drops her next book um dr nelson thank you for coming i appreciate you taking the time and, and giving this history lesson i was telling demonte those of you who are in the audience that the historians typically like give the best conversations. And I think this was, this was definitely one of our, our best talks and best conversations. I have one closing question for the both of you all before we go. Um, and Dr. Nelson, I'll begin with you. What, because we, we, we function somewhat like a book club, what books are you currently reading that you would suggest for our audience? Yes. So I, so let me center myself, my undergrad degree. So my undergrad degree is in history and in English. I have a dual degree, uh, two bachelor's degree. My master's is in public administration and my PhD is in political science. Uh, is in political science. So I, I would classify, classify myself as a black political scientist, but I truly believe that you have to have the history to then do black political science. Uh, and so things that I'm reading right now, one of the books that I'm reading right now is one that I watched from you. 
um, uh, love for liberation. This has been extremely powerful um, to me um, to, to see Pan-Africanism at work. So this book right here, another book that I'm reading right now, um, it's, it's, it's called For All the People, uh, Uncovering the Hidden Histories of Cooperation Collective movements and communalism in, in America to understand the use of communalism outside of the black context. Uh, and the last book, I, I, I had them all prepared because I watched you ask your other uh, folks this, like I said. And then the last book is The Rights Turned, it, uh, the, the Rights Turned to Conservative Christian Politics, How Abortion Transformed Culture Wars. And the reason that I'm reading this currently is that we are going, we are most likely going to see a retrying of Roe v. Wade. Um, and what, what does that mean for black people, especially here in the state of Louisiana, where you guys in Texas have basically uh, outlawed abortion. We have a flood of folks coming from Texas into Louisiana to get those abortions. And I wanted to better understand this so that I could put it in terms uh, uh, of racism for black folks. Dr. Nelson, thank you for sharing those, those books with us. I might, I might have some authors I can tap into. So, so uh, uh, for me, for me uh, uh, you'll be happy we'll be to see that I'm reading uh, Privilege and Punishment. Uh, from your guest the last time, uh, which is a very good read so far. And uh, as you already know, I, I collect all of James Baldwin's work. And so I'm reading right now, Begin Again. Um, this is, uh, you see my bookmark still in there, but uh, I'm reading this because I think it's my second time reading it. It's James Baldwin, American, uh, America and its urgent lessons for our own. And it always brings me, it always grounds me. Baldwin just grounds me, period. Um, but um, th these are a couple of books I'm reading right now. I'm not a fast reader, so I don't have like four books I'm reading right now, but I think two is, is, is pretty good for me. I do have a wall of books. You don't see them right now, but half of them I've read and the others I'm still trying to work through. But um, those are a couple of books I'm reading right now. All right. So again, thank you both for joining us. Demonte Alexander, one of the founders of the Black Equity Pact, and Dr. Sharice Nelson, author of the Congressional Black Caucus, 50 years of fighting for equality. Um, I want to thank you both for coming. Uh, guests who are in the audience, I'm going to ask you all to stay for a little while and talk about our next session that we're going to be having here with Entrepreneurial Appetite. Dr. Nelson uh, and Demonte, if you all want to leave, perfectly fine to do that. If you want to stay, I, I welcome you to stay as well. Y'all give me one second and I'll share my screen and we'll, we'll wrap it up here pretty soon. No problem. Dr. Nelson, that's how we can help you that book out. All right, so everyone, again, thank you for joining us. Next month on May 26th, that date right now is a little tentative. I still have to uh, make sure that the, the guest host and the author's schedules can work at that time and date. So it's, it's tentative, but we're gonna have a conversation about Borderland Blacks, two cities in the Niagara region. And it's interesting as we talk about immigration happening uh, at our Southern border, this book talks about black people uh, moving towards freedom during the final years of enslavement through the Underground Railroad, talking about Rochester, New York, and St. Catharines, a city that is in Canada. And so there's some really good history there. It talks about Frederick Douglass, talks about Harriet Tubman, and some other Black figures uh, that we don't know about or hear about in our history. And my, I hope to partner with uh, the founder of Bold and Gritty, which is a, 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 a bookstore, coffee shop in Rochester, New York, who features uh, black men who are doing good work in the community. And our last thing is, those of you who are uh, here for the first time, those of you who come on the regular basis, if you wanna support the show, the best way to do that is to become one of our founding 55 patrons. And for $5 a month, you get access to all of our live conversations will our monthly conversations and some bonus content as well you also get early access to the podcast recording so if you ever miss a show you can listen to it wherever you listen to podcasts on itunes apple google spotify all of that and you'll also get access to our video recordings as well so you can use the qr code there uh, to register and sign up the reason why we're trying to um 
get our founding 55 is because we want to hire a black intern or a black freelancer to help with the production of the show to expand our audience and of course to support uh, black folks in our community so thank you all for joining us i appreciate your time you all stay safe and have a good weekend Recording stuff.